السلام علیکم ویلکم ٹو ڈائلاگ ایم تیمور شامل ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ فیٹر فرسٹ آف آل دس سرٹنلی از این ایشو اینڈ پاکستان از ان دا گریٹ لیسٹ اے چیلنج فار پاکستان پاکستان ہیز بین ورکنگ آن اٹس اکانمی ول بی ڈسکسنگ اباؤٹ دس بٹ وٹ از مور امپورٹنٹ از دی پولیٹکس دیٹ ریوالوز اراؤنڈ فیٹر پاکستان ہیز ورکڈ آن آلموسٹ فورٹین آؤٹ آف ٹوینٹی سیون پوائنٹس آف فیٹر پاکستان ہیز انٹروڈیوسڈ بلز ایز ویل دا ریسنٹ گورنمنٹ and uh, as i talked about politics the internal politics and the external politics goes on uh, there is opposition versus the government they have their own points regarding gov- uh, uh, fatf there is national security and at the same time the opposition thinks that the fatf and the bills regarding fatf would be used against the uh, opposition so as far as the internal politics and in politics as they call it goes uh, this is the situation but interestingly when we talk about the external politics Uh, many experts are of the view that FATF 2 has uh, some sort of duplicity when it comes to sanctioning a uh, few states. Uh, when it comes to Afghanistan, when it comes to uh, the economy, undocumented economy in Afghanistan, undocumented economy in India, uh, somehow these two countries uh, do not invite FATF sanctions. If money laundering is that big a case, then why New York and London? are not under the sanctions of FATF. So there goes the international politics. But of course, since Pakistan is in the gray list, Pakistan has to work on uh, the uh, FATF points, the clauses that are there, 27 clauses, as I just mentioned, and some of them, they need legislation. And this is where the in- internal politics goes on inside Pakistan between the government and the opposition. We're going to talk about FATF, politics around it, internal and external, and economy, With our special guest in the studios, our first guest is Mr. Shakil Rame. He's an expert on Pakistan's economy. Welcome to the show, uh, Shakil. Our second guest is Mr. Muhammad Ali, uh, renowned uh, expert on Pakistan's foreign policy as well as national security. Welcome to the show, Ali. Uh, Shakil, starting with this, uh, this development, uh, the way I mentioned, the politics, first of all, internal and external, and then state of economy, money laundering and terror financing. How do you see this whole situation? I think uh, you have uh, summarized the whole story. So there is a much, not much to say. Because it is basically the politics. If you look at the FATF, that is not any binding agency. Mm. It's a voluntary agency. So its uh, findings are not binding on the countries. But when some, uh, some the country is coming to the gray list, it has certain implications for that country on the economic side. Coming back, uh, uh, coming to the economic side, I will come back later, yes. but the first no, politics. Look, and if you are talking about the U.S., if you look at the behavior of U.S. before we started the peace, Afghan peace mm-hmm. talk, mm-hmm. and after that the behavior. Mm-hmm. Before that, they were trying, they were putting their all efforts to bring Pakistan in the, gray, in the blacklist. But when Pakistan is uh, helping them to have a peace deal in Afghanistan, mm-hmm. they have uh, started to change their behavior. Although not fully changed, because everybody is uh, looking for the settlement of Afghan peace process. So then it, there will be the final decisions. So basically, it's a political game. Right. So when you have a political game, that <coughs> means whatever you do, whatever legislation you do, whatever bill you introduce, it will not help you much, until unless the global political economy is not in your favor. Mm. Mm. So that is a fundamental thing we have to the keep system, in mind. The system, the global and, political right. economy. You have to keep in mind. In global political economy, we are also having one or two uh, other things which uh, we have facing problems. Number one, the CPEC. When we, if you look at that, America, they are hell bent to oppose BRI, China, and CPEC. Even their high top uh, high, in their uh, top people in their politics and their uh, foreign policy, they criticize CPEC. Hmm. They advise Pakistan not to go for the CPEC. Hmm. Open. It's not hmm. any gears are behind the Alice door Fels, anymore. Ellis Fells. So hmm. it's not behind the door. On it's a open. Hmm. So people are talking about. But Pakistan know that CPEC is our core. Uh, CPEC is our core project hmm. for our development, for the prosperity in the long run. Right. So you will see not only from the FATF, but also from the other corner, the opposition to the CPEC and the people who are attached to the CPEC. Right, rightly said, Shakir. I'll, I'll come on the economy point before that. Ali, there's duplicity that is there when it comes to sanctioning few states and then you know, sparing others, as I just mentioned, Afghanistan and, and India. Now, uh, I think we all know about Afghanistan and we all know about regional countries, at least about India as well. 
uh, if money laundering is that uh, is, is a big uh, issue, then why do we spare London and and New York? You have been to these countries and Europe and America. You know the system. What do you think about this duplicity, first of all? Um, I think uh, Ramesh has rightly pointed out, and I'll uh, take it from where he left, that essentially uh, economic coercion is increasingly being used uh, for geopolitical agenda by the world powers. And that is how uh, we can simply explain uh, FATF as an instrument of uh, economic coercion uh, to those countries uh, which are vulnerable and dependent on the current world order uh, in which, uh, unfortunately, uh, despite new opportunities that CPEC and collaboration with China offers, Pakistan is still uh, heavily dependent on the export markets in Western Europe and North America. Mm -hmm. America still is our largest export market. Uh, we are still heavily engaged with uh, international financial institutions which continue to be dominated mm -hmm. by the Western powers like IMF <coughs> and World Bank. And even to some extent, if you look at the global economic power structure, even the Middle Eastern remittances are indirectly influenced mm -hmm. uh, by the Western powers. So if you see Pakistan's vulnerability and way forward in order to reduce this vulnerability towards uh, the economic coercion uh, led by the US, then like you rightly pointed out, I think the, the evidence is itself available mm -hmm. manifested in the different behavior that the US and Western powers exhibit towards Afghanistan and India. TTP, BLA, so many outputs mm. are mm. overtly and actively operating from the Afghan soil. Why there is no pressure on Afghanistan government, World's on Kabul government, that they fail. Mm. They, in fact, failure is an understatement. They somehow have been uh, taking pride in supporting these elements like BLA and TTP against the territorial integrity and national security of uh, neighboring countries like Pakistan. You see the current administration in New Delhi is heavily influenced by RSS, RSS and uh, Bajr and Dal Shiv Sena. And, and Shiv Sena. These organizations, why there is no pressure on India mm. that uh, no exports should be uh, made to the Western market by those outfits which are uh, led or influenced by shareholders who belong to RSS or uh, um, Bajrangdal. I think there should be an expectation from India and our like-minded countries to begin with China. China, you know, has almost a hundred billion dollar bilateral right. trade with right. India. To begin with, first we can raise it with Beijing that they should expect a uh, certification from India that any <coughs> organization or entity which has on its board of directors, on its leadership, anybody who is associated with RSS or Bajrak Dal should not be allowed to export its products to the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. That could be the starting point. Right, right. This is very interesting. Uh, Shakil, this is the geopolitics. But when it comes to economy, uh, Prime Minister is pretty much concerned about this, you know, recently in his interview. How serious is the situation for Pakistan? Although we have been discussing this in the past, but once again for our viewers, how serious is the situation, this grey listing and blacklisting for Pakistan and the situation at the moment? Look, as I was describing it earlier, it's not a binding, but it has implications. Mm -hmm. First of all, if any kind of, as we are in a grey list, so for uh, God forbidden, if some country is in the blacklist, that's mean if any uh, businessman or investors who wants to come to Pakistan or do some business with the Pakistani uh, business community, they have to go, go through a number of the uh, judgments and some of the monitorings, evaluations. They have to submit the documents to different parties. Number one, that's mean they are consuming their time. And no businessman, no businessman want to, either that's every bank coming to them and say, oh, show us these documents because they're doing business with some country, so which is a gray list or on the black list. No businessman will want to do that because they don't want to expose their assets or their expose their accounts or their business to mm -hmm. any other body. Mm -hmm. One thing and second thing, they don't want to delay their uh, payments. That is a effect which hinders the investment in your country. Mm -hmm. 
which hinder the governments from other country to a uh, businessman from other country to do the business in term of the export imports. That would be discouraged. The not discouraged, it's, it's have heavy implications. Mm -hmm. It negatively implicate, uh, on a, uh, implicate the economy. Right. So that means that you are discouraging investment and trade. That will definitely, if you minus the trade and investment in any economy, what is left mm -hmm. behind? There is nothing. Mm -hmm. So that is the area where they especially hit apart from the other areas. So many people think that it's not just about uh, the bills or introducing the laws. There are many laws and bills, very strict, I would say, laws uh, as far as the money laundering goes. But implementing those laws is very important. And there is what, that's the area where we need to work. Look, one thing is national implementation, as Ali was talking about, implement national level. Mm -hmm. That is definitely weak in certain areas, especially if you look at the FATF. Basically, it started for them to stop the money laundering, not the terror financing. It started with the to oppose the money laundering. Mm -hmm. And money laundering is a big problem in Pakistan. If you look at uh, everybody is talking about it, it's not only uh, you can talk about the politicians, you can find also mm -hmm. people from the other areas. Uh, but right now, unfortunately, only we focus on the politician, but you can find people from every field. So, uh, Hundi is also money laundering. Uh, uh, Hundi and Hawala. So, so uh, Hawala. These are other, other things. That is a problem. But at the global level, is also a problem. Pakistan have to be the proactive right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they are in a defensive mood. They must be in the offensive mood. They said, okay, we are, we are going to do it, but we need these information, which are the destination for the money laundering. Virgin Islands, we need this information from the UK. If you are not taking care of the destinations because you are providing them the facility to hide their money so it is for the fatf to provide with, uh, uh, the no, not the FATF. The if uh, we should talk to those countries okay okay FATF, we have to talk to the uh, fatf hmm. look these countries are your members make them uh, make it binding for them to provide this uh, information to stop this money laundering right, right for example there a few days back there was a video from a from a uk journalist he was showing that there was happening there the whole the yeah, london is the home to the money laundering yes. and the virgin islands are home to the money laundering where is money is going? Hmm. Is going to the money to Pakistan hmm. or to some other country? No. Hmm. Money is going to these all developed countries. Pakistan must be very proactive on that and offensive. Look, we need this information to provide us. Otherwise, we will not be able to do that. One thing, second thing, on economy. You are, uh, uh, Ali was talking about uh, India and you are also talking about India. Hmm. So why they had given a leverage to India? Because they have the economic interest. They want to build him against the China, which is, which is not possible. So they, that's why they're giving him the leverage. And there's, you can see so much hypocrisy at the Indian level and the international level. So on one side, the Indians are lynching people for the beef or cow. On the other side, they are the one of the major uh, top five. Uh, they will lie in the top five of the exporter of the beef. Right. So that is a hypocrisy. Right, of course, duplicity is there. But this proactive approach, Ali, uh, this is a very interesting point raised by Shakil. What do you think about this? Raising up this issue with the countries that are involved in this money laundering that would be that would be good for pakistan and perhaps we can work on it what do you think about i this? think uh, we need a comprehensive approach mm. at uh, three levels at the domestic level at the regional level and at the global level we need to improve our economic governance mm. we need to expand the tax net and transparency for our own interest. Mm. Whether there is some international coercion, expectation, that's notwithstanding not, right. the point. We need, because we need to expand our tax net. Mm. We need to regulate our economy. Most of the things that you and I purchase during every month grocery uh, is not taxed. So we need to expand our tax net. This will incrementally help the current uh, PTI government's agenda as well because they want to expand Pakistan Shikil Sa will tell you has a huge issue because we are uh, desperate to expand our tax revenue and that is only possible when the economy is documented when it is regulated so that is the first thing for our own interest at the regional level we need to expand and thankfully, here you see a synergy of geopolitics and geoeconomics that we are uh, improving our social and economic interaction with China, with Afghanistan, with Iran. This will incrementally reduce our dependence on Western markets. Mm. We are culturally uh, similar. Uh, 
we are close by, the lifestyles are similar, so that uh, Sadiq Saab is doing an excellent job in uh, Kabul uh, with Afghanistan. We need to improve our relations and uh, uh, with Iran as well. This will translate into more export revenue with regional countries hmm. and reduce proportionately our dependence and vulnerability uh, regarding the Western powers and Western markets. And the third level is global and that is also incremental. Hmm that gradually with CPAC and emergence of parallel international financial institutions like uh, Asian Inve uh, Investment Inter Infrastructure Bank and other organizations, we should gradually reduce the dependence on Western financial institutions like IMF and World Bank, diversify our markets. We, are, we have recently, you know, uh, have, uh, uh, you know, look, look East policy as well as we are reaching out more proactively to Afghanistan, mm -hmm. uh, to Africa and also to Latin America. So our industry also needs to be smart, competitive and recover from this economic dependence right. on Western markets. But this is a very uh, interesting point, but Shakil, we have been discussing this, this point specifically of trade diversifying the, the industry for that matter. And we have a long way to go, by the way. But talking about the region, uh, this is not an easy region. Yes. We see war in Afghanistan, sanctions on Iran, you know, aggression from the Indian side. Of course, we have good, very good relations with China. But talking about Iran and Afghanistan, do you think that Pakistan at this moment, while these countries are under sanctions and war and internal rift, can diversify its economy? Look, first of all, when we talk about a diversify export, or uh, diversify the destiny, what we can offer to the country? Hmm. These are four, five year products only. Why our first FATF with the China could not bring the fruits which we were uh, hoping? Because we, were want uh, we, we wanted to export them rice. They have abundance of rice. Hmm. We wanted to export them garments or textile. They are the biggest exporter of garment. So, what do you want to and diversify? Let's talk about Iran and Afghanistan. So, what do you want to diversify for, for Afghanistan that we have the market? Mm. But th this is a, we have to look at that. What resources that country have? If you uh, minus the uh, foreign aid from my, uh, Afghanistan side, so that means you are uh, there is a nothing. Mm. If you are looking at Afghanistan, you have to look at the brotherly country to whom you have to help. First, you have to help them to build their economy through mm. CPAC. Mm. And fortunately, we are working on that. Don't look at the market destination then. Look as a brotherly country to whom to have you to help to build as institutions and the country because they are facing the war for the last four decades. In terms of the FY Iran, we can have some mm. you know, leverages, especially for the rice export. But for that purpose, if you look at that, we don't have the uh, official banking system with Iran. Right. Even if Iran have to pay the salary to their staff in their embassy, they have to go through a very long process. So what do you talk about the trade? It's a, it seems fancy when you're talking about, oh, we can do it. But you need a lot of the homework. So that is right. a real problem where we are stuck. We have to work on that. So and second thing, Ali was talking about the tax. Hmm. I am <clears> in a favor of system. Don't only depend on the tax. You have to, be the, you have to mix your sources, the balance your sources. The government should, must, have some, must have some entities in the business, like steel mill like PIA, like other, they should go for the state-owned enterprises. <coughs> I'm strongly in favor of that. But the only problem is their governance. We have to build their governance. Mm. We had an excellent opportunity right now to rebuild our steel mill because we are going to invest in our two or three big dams. We are going to invest in our ML1. So there, is, there will be a huge demand for the steel. So you have the huge market there. You can rebuild your uh, right, steel right. mill, but you have to go for the right set of Coming governance. Coming back to FATA, one question about the again about the implementation and the laws. What do you think about this? That the laws are there still. We have a lot of laws, but when it comes to implementation, that is where the issue is for Pakistan. Look in Pakistan, in implementation, the misuse of the law. For example, if we can tell you, the first anti-terror law was introduced during the regime in 1970s, but it was used again the political leadership of the opponent parties. The real problem is not only implementation, but also a misuse of the law. Mm. That's why sometimes people reject those laws because they fear in the long run it can be misused against them. So, so what we, we have to do, we have to bring the transparent system of implementation where nobody can object. It's a misuse of the law. So why cannot we work on these laws to be you know, smooth? And That's not what to I'm saying. We have to bring a transparent system. Mm. 
we are everything go in the transparency. It should not be like that. Somebody say, oh, he is doing wrong, so he should be bring to the justice. So this recent situation now, government versus the opposition, this is going to have an ad adverse impact on 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 Definitely. the national You're security right. and absolutely on absolutely right. You are absolutely right. But there we need the political maturity from the both side, mm. the political wisdom from the both side. They don't have to take it as a PTI or the PMLN or a PP or some other party law. They have to take it as a Pakistani law. And they have to refine it, everybody, not only the government, it's also, but the primary duty is of the government to satisfy everybody. Mm. So if there is anything like they are going for, they are demanding something which is not true, or as you can just, uh, that is unjustifiable. Government can reject, but it's the primary responsibility of the government to bring everybody on uh, the same page, so we can move forward smoothly. Ali, you have a point? Basically, I think uh, the domestic governance and its efficiency improves our ability to look good internationally mm -hmm. and also meet our international obligations. <coughs> because after 18th Amendment, unfortunately, our state's ability to manage the governance and also implement international uh, obligations has somewhat right. been reduced. So that is a challenge, but like uh, Ramesh Saab rightly pointed out, Essentially, it's a governance issue, mm. and that is r unfortunately also related to culture. Uh, when you make laws without creating an awareness <clears throat> or an incentive for the public right. to pay uh, taxes, to make uh, their transactions transparent, it requires a lot of cultural um, understanding and a transformation, which requires a specific tangible incentives not just our carrot and stick uh, approach. Right, right. That is very important, without which obviously lo making laws is important, but to implement those laws you need to create incentives and transform the culture mm. of, uh, to gradually build a society which uh, values good governance. And system. to strengthen those regulatory bodies, you know, yeah. that is very important to keep them running. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Shikil, thank you for joining us. We'll be discussing about racism in the United States, and this is a very crucial point because this is the election year in, in America, uh, President Trump versus uh, uh, Joe Biden. And uh, we have seen in the past the way African Americans have been targeted in the United States, and there is this structural racism in the United States. We'll be discussing about that and the impact of that on the internal <coughs> politics of the United States. You stay with us. We'll take a break. What's going on there? Welcome back. Uh, racism in the United States is a big issue, and this racism is in, uh, structural uh, in America. Uh, recently, there were riots uh, all over America on the killing of Floyd, an African American who was killed by the police. And uh, the Black Lives Matter movement has been putting up a lot of pressure on the Trump administration. Also keeping in mind that the rise of the far right in the United States is a big concern for many people living in U.S. and outside of U.S. Uh, the white supremacist is uh, another thing that has been a major concern for the people living in the United States, the people of color. Uh, President Trump and his vote bank of evangelicals and uh, the white supremacists have been portraying this whole thing in a specific way. We'll be discussing about Black Lives Matter, racism in the United States, and its impact on United States politics and the role that this issue would play in United States internal politics. We are joined by uh, Ms. Bariza Omar. She's a social uh, cultural analyst with us. Uh, welcome to the show, Ms. Bariza. Thank you. Well, discussing about this Black Lives Matter and this racism in the United States, how do you see the situation and the role that this issue is going to play in American domestic politics? So this is obviously a long-standing issue um, with the Civil War and then um, post-Civil War we had the um, uh, segregation and separate but equal. Um, in the 60s there was finally the, the Civil Rights Movement and Brown versus the Board of Education. Um, you had <clears throat> Martin Luther King Jr.'s March on Washington in 1963 and there was just uh, on the anniversary of it yesterday we had another march on Washington, this time not for jobs and freedom, but this time uh, they titled it Get Your Knee Off Our Necks. Um, we 
the the violence, the systemic racism, the systemic violence against the African American community, the Black American community, is nothing new. Um, but a lot of non-Black people in the United States are getting more exposed to it now because of media, obviously, more things are being caught on film. Um, the last time that there were huge riots in, in the United States in the 90s was with Rodney King and someone caught that uh, police beating of an African-American man on video. And subsequently, there have been um, many more lives lost to um, police violence. And in in this uh, in this election year, it's become even more um, pressing, and it's somehow it feels different this time because of the allies that have um, the the anti-racism uh, mm -hmm. movement has really grown amongst non-Black Americans because um, their minorities have always had um, my, minorities have always had to talk about their own. Uh, struggles with within themselves you have to educate your children about how you are held to higher standards with the police how you must interact with the police how um you will always be treated a little bit differently um and so you need to hold yourself to higher standards despite the the systems that have held you back in in ghettos in um with redlining not being able to buy property with um the, the taxation paying for schooling and therefore not as as good schools in less affluent neighborhoods with gerrymandering, meaning that um, polling places in largely African-American neighborhoods are being shut down or public transport systems are making it more difficult for them to get to polling systems and um, cast their votes. Uh, this is especially true in, in the recent past where, um, or even um, for the since Martin Luther King Jr., where you right, have right, right, right. largely uh, African-American women are the largest vote bank for Democrats. And so the pressure this year for Joe Biden to not only um, have a running mate who was a woman, but also to have an African-American running mate hmm. um, has led, of course, to his, his appointment of Kamala Harris right. as his running right, mate. Right. Bariza, please stay with us uh, on call. Are you talking about this discrimination and that is almost at every level, let it be at the school level, college, university, when it comes to policing, you know, the American cops. How do you see the, the uh, situation of human rights and, and uh, uh, the African Americans in the United States? Uh, Shamil, I think the upcoming elections are going to be one of the most decisive mm. in the U.S. political history for three reasons. Number one, I think these elections in particular will be fought on race. Number two, for a very long time, mm. perhaps since the black rights movement of 60s, this is perhaps the most polarized race relations that the U.S. has witnessed in a very long time. Mm. And thirdly, I think uh, the debate the relations, the societal sentiment in the U.S. has never been so charged mm. on the race for a very long time, for 60 years. So I think uh, the Republican administration are perhaps at a huge handicap, not only because of their uh, reliance on the white conservative vote, but also their insensitivity mm. towards handling this very <clears throat> delicate and sensitive issue. And thirdly, you see Democrats having a huge advantage uh, in the upcoming elections because not only that they ideologically align themselves with the liberal agenda, with the liberal narrative, but also because their vote bank heavily relies right. on the minorities, the, uh, the blacks, uh, and the educated middle class, which um, you know is pop which populates the uh, uh, the East Coast and the West Coast. So I think um, and. No administration has um, so badly damaged the U.S. soft power right. at a global level yeah. than the current administration. Because the U.S. administration's narrative yeah. that the U.S. dream is worth exporting to the world and is worth uh, emulating by the rest of the world. This has been questioned like never before. Right. That right. if you can't manage your own minorities... Yeah. 
how can you tell other countries developing countries how can you sermonize other countries hmm. uh, what is what to do right, on human right. rights and other issues so there is this duplicity i think there is this uh, the us meta narrative hmm. at the global level and their international image as a world power which ha which is confident of its val its liberal values uh, is very weakened now hmm. because its credibility is under question and uh, i think biden is going to hugely cash onto it in the upcoming uh, election campaign that uh, the us credibility as a world leader is very damaged because of its inability uh, to manage the race relations effectively justly and fairly at the domestic level so their argument about talking about human rights of the rest of the world of the developing world uh, i think it's its locus standi is no lo more there basically right right and and bariza if we uh, observe president trump's uh, response to the recent uh, riots i would say uh, the black lives matter and the way people have been protesting to the killings in the united states of the Af african americans president trump has uh, been clearly standing with the uh, with the other side with white people the way police has been dealing with the african americans with the people of color and uh, we didn't see any sort of apologetic uh, response from uh, Trump administration. How do you see uh, this as an, uh, uh, as an impact on the culture and politics of the United States? Um, I, I certainly agree, I certainly agree that, that there is much more polarization um, than there has been before. Um, I, I would depart um, saying that, yes, we all love pointing fingers and, and saying that um, the, the credibility of the United States and, and look at how they're managing their own problems and who's not able to say yeah. anything to anyone else. However, every, every country has human rights issues. Um, this is just the one that is being talked about right now. We have our own in Pakistan. Um, I would say this, is, this has been um, the case in the Trump presidency, even while he was campaigning. One of the first instances of when he publicly tweeted about um, what side he took was when he said that there were good people on both sides when things were happening in um, when when uh, a white supremacist crashed their car killing someone during one of these uh, protests um, early on in his presidency um, <clears throat> he has uh, taken it upon himself to very clearly align himself with not just the police but police unions which are a very problematic institution that have been the reason that no police officers have been, um, let alone convicted, most of them haven't even been charged for the, the murders that they commit. Um, however, it he is also very effective in how he um, rallies his base to not look at the the killings or, or um, demonize the people who have been killed rather than um, look at the, the systemic problems, which <clears throat> it, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter who the person was. The loss of property is not the equivalent to the loss of human life. And he has very effectively managed to um, turn this into rioting rather than protesting. And really, it's like people can't get, catch a break because now you have the peaceful protesters who are like the canceling of sporting events because you have teams and players who are um, boycotting these sporting events in order to peacefully protest. And there is backlash there as well. Colin Kaepernick taking the knee and he was professionally and um, in the media, he was he was torn apart because of his peaceful stance. So whether there is rioting um, is how they would like to put it or um, in, in what just happened in Kenosha where you have the police actually thanking white supremacist militants who are coming and um, keeping the peace uh, because the police need help and, and you have a white supremacist 17-year-old carrying a rifle with people running after him saying that he killed someone and being able to go back to his home and spend the night at home uh, after someone else was just shot point blank seven times in the back. Um, it's, it's really uh, mind-boggling where, where this has gone. Right, right, right. Ali, talking about this this point, this is very important. Gun violence, uh, 
America is also a very religious society at the same time. The Bible Belt um, and the rise of the far right uh, in response to this Black Lives Matter thing that is going on over there. Where do you see U.S. heading? And looking at President Trump, the way he supports the, the, the uh, white movement, the way he is not very apologetic about what has happened in, happened in, in, in many parts of the United States, the way African Americans have been protesting against the, the uh, uh, discrimination. How do you see this? I think the U.S. society and the U.S. state and their mutual uh, social contract is right now undergoing a very profound uh, test, mm. which is, I think, very, uh, very critical in its, you know, history, entire history. Because in the 21st century, as some of the leading ideologues like Kissinger, Huntington, uh, have been, and, and uh, Fukuyama have mm. been arguing uh, that U.S. has the uh, confidence and the values to lead the world towards peace, prosperity, and progress. This claim uh, before the world is being tested today like never before. The U.S. soft power has been dented like never before. Uh, the social fabric is weakened. And you see uh, unprecedented failure by the state to be sensitive towards the social issues uh, afoot and the trends in the in in the um, U.S. society. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great test in the history for the U.S. political system, right. not just the current administration. When you see the strength of the U.S. Uh, Shamil has been that whenever um, uh, there are, there is a separation of power of power concept mm -hmm. in in the U.S., which is which they take pride in that if the White House is not performing, the Congress will, uh, you know, fill in that vacuum and the other institutions will also compensate. Right. But while the, ad the current administration, the Republican administration has failed to show sensitivity towards the mm -hmm. social trends, the other institutions, the think tanks, the academia, mm. uh, the intelligentsia, they are also absent uh, and conspicuous by absence mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of providing the intellectual leadership, the moral solutions uh, to address these social challenges. So I think uh, there is a failure of leadership, not just at the domestic level, but obviously uh, evident at the global level. And this crisis of leadership right. will define the world peace, progress and prosperity and also, uh, I think, leave a very deep imprint on the current world order. Because this world, with the COVID crisis, uh, with the emergence mm -hmm. of alternative poles, uh, an integrated economy, a globalized world, needs a visionary mm -hmm. world leadership like never before, which the US system, not just Mr. Trump uh, as an individual, seems not to provide. And this is basically, in one word, is the crisis of leadership at the world level. Right. And <clears throat> at the domestic level, the U.S. administration and the system fails to offer timely, effective solution to address this very critical social critical. challenges. Certainly. And, and uh, Brisa, do you think that at the moment, U.S. is divided on liberal and conservative lines? Uh, because the way, let's say, uh, Biden has been challenging Trump and saying that this is going to have an impact on the Republican uh, administration, when uh, Biden was, Joe Biden was the uh, vice president, Democrats couldn't do much about the racism to keep a check on the racism in the United States. Obama was the president. Uh, but we didn't see much that even the Democrats could do about this kind of racism, and now it has deteriorated. Do you see it that way? Um, so when Obama was president, I think that was when we saw really how per pervasive really um, racism is, because there are a lot of things that he could not get done, which had he been white, would not have been so problematic. When he came out and spoke about the 12 year old, well, the child, really, Tamir Rice, who was murdered, and he he was almost in tears when he said that if that had been 
uh, if he had a boy, that could have been his son. Um, there, he couldn't do much about it. He was he was roadblocked at every at every level um, with his domestic policies, and I think that was with with a, a largely Republican House and Senate. It was very difficult for him to do anything. However, um, Biden will not face the same problems. Um, he has uh, huge support within the African American community. However, there is um, with Kamala Harris. She is a black woman, yes, um, but there are a lot of issues with her history as a prosecutor. And uh, a lot of the black community is not necessarily pleased with her selection because she put, a, she, she, um, she participated in the system which, which incarcerates black, especially black men, but um, black, black American individuals at a much higher rate. Black Americans make up for 40% of the prison population and they're they're less than they're about 13% of the general general population of the United States. Um, so that I, I'm not sure um, what is going to happen with that. However, I will say a lot of Trump so people who voted for Trump in the last round of elections did do not see themselves as being racist. And a lot of what is happening now is really um, pushing them to not vote for Trump this time around because they, they don't believe that they are racist. And that was not why they voted for Trump the first time around. So I, I do think that there is a chance that, that the politics is um, has changed. It's not all about the economy. Now it's about COVID and race, mm -hmm. um, which is certainly new in American politics. Right, right. Mariza, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time. Ali, thank it's you. like you're having on the show. Thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure. That's all from today's dialogue. See you next time. Khuda Hafiz.